Thank you and welcome to this season's last discussion of the International Speaker Series. In keeping with this program's forward-looking charter, we've had Professor Dick Millett ponder if and when wars truly end, William Minor postulate the pros of living in an age of information technology, we've heard Professor Silovich observe Turkey and its evolving influence in the greater Middle East, while at the same time maintaining a precarious peace with its Kurdish citizens. Last month, we listened as Adam Lothar spoke of how China views itself and how its leadership is exerting its political, geopolitical influence to maintain internal political and economic stability. And the underlying theme of all these discussions is change, and at times, very radical change. The very nature of some of the topics discussed this season would have been a stretch to imagine just a few very short years ago. So in this era of evolving global change and innovation, some contend that our leadership of the United States at all levels must relearn and alter the way that we think and to make more effective use of our natural resources and human sources to maintain political, economic, and military relevance. Against that background, this season's final speaker is a very special guest. During his 51 years of honorable service, General Rocky has lived the life of distinguished warrior, <coughs> diplomat, and academic. General Rocky earned his commission in the United States Air Force in 1962 and currently occupies the chair of Scholar in Residence Center for the Character and Leadership Development at the Air Force Academy. During his military and academic career, he has earned a PhD in International Relations from Harvard and served with distinction in leadership assignments to include serving as defense attache to the Soviet Union, air attache to US Embassy London, NSA Associate Director for Military Operations Support, Air Force Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence, and Dean of Faculty at the United States Air Force Academy. There are very few more qualified to give us the very short tour of where America has been, where we are, and some of the challenges that we will face in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me and welcome General Irv Rocky. Thanks so much, Brent. Can you hear me? Sir, yes, sir. It's working okay. Okay. Just uh, for my own uh, edification, since I'm going to be targeting you students at some point. I'd like to know what your academic interests, get a feel for where you are in terms of your academic interests. Um, how many do I have from the social sciences arena? Poli, sci, psych, okay. Uh, how about the humanities? Okay. Uh, engineering sciences? Great. Uh, basic sciences. Any physicists? Okay. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Brent, for, for that uh, kind introduction. I find that the older I get, uh, the more I appreciate such positive comments. But I'm also becoming more realistic about uh, how shaky such plaudits can be. Uh, I'm reminded of a story about Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur who found themselves uh, thrown from a small boat off the coast of the Philippines. They were out fishing uh, during World War II. And they were able to climb back into the boat, but the process was not a pretty sight. Admiral Nimitz said, now Mac, don't mention this to anyone. You see, I'd, I'd be disgraced if the men of the Navy knew I can't swim. Don't worry, MacArthur re replied. Your secret is safe. You see, 
I'd hate to have my men find out I can't walk on water. <laughs> it's, it's true that generals, admirals, politicians, CEOs, and, and even professors sometimes forget just how realistically we are perceived uh, by our colleagues and subordinates. This, this lesson was driven home to me years ago during a Sayonara party uh, upon my departure from the Dean of Faculty position at the Air Force Academy. Master of Ceremonies was a faculty member with tenure, I might say, uh, who said some kind things about my stewardship as dean. But his closing comment really got my attention. General Rocky, he concluded with a twinkle in his eye, can be replaced by a lieutenant with a stepladder. <laughs> Think about that. Probably the best description uh, of my prowess actually came from the KGB when I was serving uh, in Moscow during the, the late 80s. Uh, their call sign for me was Pol Tora Ivan, which roughly translated means one and a half Ivan the Terribles. Uh, my wife and kids really liked uh, that monitor. But whatever the case, I'm looking forward to offering you some notions today that are of a, a more serious nature. And I will apologize in advance for the bias that will undoubtedly uh, come through. I did, after all, wear a blue, a blue uniform for some 40 years. But my professional life has been divided into approximately equal parts of academic administration and teaching, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, operational assignments, mostly overseas intelligence assignments uh, in my uh, uh, operational military life. And I'm also increasingly convinced, incidentally, that the challenges I'm going to portray today are equally applicable, not only to all the military services, but to virtually every responsible profession in the private sector. My theses are simple. First, the profession of arms, like its counterparts in the civilian world, is facing a dramatically increased complexity, level of complexity in all its endeavors. Second, my generation is leaving you, and I'm speaking primarily to the students here with this, in this regard, we're leaving you with something of a mess uh, that you can resolve only by implementing new ways of thinking. I repeat, by implementing new ways of thinking. To put this into some historical context, which is what old gray-haired guys like I like to do, let me briefly reminisce. Recollection of my professional life uh, starts uh, in the summer of 1957, uh, when I was sworn in as an ROTC cadet on the football field of St. Olaf College in Northfield, uh, Minnesota. I, I know there are some of you here today, particularly those of you in, in, in green, uh, who probably can recall a similar event uh, in your backgrounds. The difference was that in my day, ROTC was mandatory for male freshmen at many land-grant colleges, and, and like it or not, we wore those uniforms every Thursday. The Air Force was only 10 years old at that point, but already had emerged as an independent uh, and slightly rebellious member of the armed services. His first challenge, some of you will remember, uh, was the Berlin Airlift, which had actually created some legitimate heroes, the crews of those C-54s and, and uh, C-47 transport aircraft, who by May of, of 1949 were carrying about 10,000 tons uh, of supplies into Berlin each day. It's, it's still not clear, incidentally, who blew up a Russian communication tower which endangered the flights landing at Tegel Airfield uh, in Berlin. The Russians had refused to move the tower, and the British and American airmen all claimed to have been at a party thrown by their French counterparts when the explosion was heard. But the problem went away in any event, and it wasn't long before the Soviets announced that the blockade would be lifted. Major General, then Major General Curtis LeMay, a name that some of you might recall, 
was the commander of the American Air Force uh, in Europe at that point. Two years earlier, he'd been called by his boss and asked the question, can you transport coal by air? Well, those of you who recall General LeMay won't be surprised by his answer. He said, the Air Force can deliver anything. Uh, well, like the, like the Navy and like the Army, uh, the Air Force was becoming quite good at, at earning its keep. And I was increasingly comfortable in that blue uniform that I wore every Thursday at St. Olaf College. And I jumped at the opportunity uh, to move from St. Olaf to this, a, a new place called the Air Force Academy in 1958. Uh, among other things, uh, the Academy tuition was right for a Minnesota farm kid like me who had run out of money. While, uh, while a dually, that's what we referred to freshman at the Air Force Academy was not, was not particularly fun. Uh, I was fascinated by what my political science and history uh, professors had to offer. The Cold War, of course, made it a cinch to separate the bad guys from the good guys. Uh, warfare, we were taught, was intensely rational. We simply counted ships, planes, tanks, missiles uh, on both sides of the Iron Curtain and predicted with pre with impressive precision, at least that is what we thought, who would win in any military conflict. Our nation's strategic doctrine was something called massive retaliation. MAD is another acronym that comes to name, it comes to mind, mutual assured destruction, which emphasized nuclear weaponry. It, and incidentally, those nuclear weapons were relatively easy to spot from aerial reconnaissance and so on to count. And interestingly enough, emerging uh, as nuclear scientists were not so much the military, but rather they were academics at, at a, an assortment of leading institutions uh, in the country. Uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, a gent by the name of Tom Schelling, whom you political scientists should have encountered uh, by this point, <coughs> offered brilliant notions about a new concept uh, we called deterrence. Henry Kissinger uh, wrote a book entitled Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, in which he suggested that tactical nuclear weapons, that's small nuclear weapons, uh, were not essentially different from large conventional weapons, and perhaps he wrote they could be effectively used in combat situations. Needless to say, he was to change his mind uh, on that. But the assumption that no rational opponent would take military action against a stalwart strategic force remained in vogue. All of this was good, of course, for the, for the United States Air Force, particularly for strategic air command. Now, I will admit that some doubts came to my mind, and you Army folks will be happy to hear this, uh, when I read a book entitled The Uncertain Trumpet by Army uh, General Max Taylor. The oral uh, book report I gave on that in my poli-sci class at the Air Force Academy was not very well received. After all, Taylor disputed the notion that strategic weapons alone were sufficient for our defense needs. There remained, he asserted, an important role, particularly for the United States Army. Well, it wasn't long before the Cuban Missile Crisis seemed to confirm that the most important game in town was nuclear. Uh, Khrushchev had tried to improve his strategic equation on the cheap and back down, as would any rational opponent we had been taught, in the face of our strategic might. In short, like the television we watched in those days, national security issues seemed black and white. The bipolar world with, with Moscow and, and Washington essentially in charge was, was relatively straightforward, uh, if not simple. Uh, as a new second lieutenant, there was no doubt in my mind that who, uh, who the real enemy was and that we had him trumped with our impressive strategic nuclear resources. I'm suffering the results of the snowstorm that hit us about three days before it hit you. So please excuse my voice. 
Well, then came Vietnam. For starters, Vietnam wasn't supposed to happen because of our nuclear superiority. And once it did, few of the, of the notions that, that I had studied as a cadet, or for that matter, I had studied as a graduate student, seemed to work. This would not be the first time in my career that I found my thinking about national security uh, to be deficient. Now, to be sure, we were doing our things in Vietnam quite effectively. In the Air Force, we were flying uh, lots of sorties. We dropped lots of bombs. We destroyed bridges, factories, power plants. But the war continued. Our well-manicured policy of, of gradual escalation showed textbook rationality, made for great political science classes. But the last chapter came out badly. It was my generation's war, uh, so to speak, and I can assure you that the decade of the 1960s was not good for the military establishment. As, as demonstrated by violence in, in Chicago during the Democratic Party convention, uh, our political system was also under very substantial <coughs> stress. In any event, after, after four years in the Middle East, or in the Far East, supporting our effort in Vietnam, I returned to the Air Force Academy as a political science instructor, only to find that the clarity I described earlier of my cadet days was gone. The intellectual framework on which I had cut my teeth had been destroyed by our experience in Vietnam, and it still hurt too much to craft, construct a new one. As, as faculty members, particularly in the social sciences side of the house, we argued a lot. I also noticed that cadets seldom went off base in uniforms. Some bought wigs uh, to cover their short military haircuts. Others parted their hair right down the middle. In those days, that was a subtle way of indicating disdain for the establishment. In any event, in, in 1973, I volunteered for an assignment to NATO headquarters in Brussels to work for a young ambassador by the name of, of uh, Don Rumsfeld. Uh, frankly, it was an effort on my part to escape the ideological tensions that had emerged in academe because of the stresses and strains of, of Vietnam. NATO headquarters was a busy place in those days. Uh, we struggled to achieve a consensus among the Allies uh, about such things as how to balance properly our conventional forces on the one hand with nuclear forces on the other. We backed away, incidentally, uh, from the earlier dependence on nuclear weapons and sought allied support uh, for more stalwart NATO conventional forces. In other words, General Taylor probably had it right in his book, The Uncertain Trumpet. Washington also decided to replace the very unpopular draft uh, with a volunteer military. And the dire predictions that an all-volunteer force would attract only society's most unfortunate uh, turned out to be wrong, and a new professional military began to, uh, began to emerge. I was assigned as the air attaché uh, in London during the early 80s, and two young senators, then young senators, by the name of, names of uh, Gary Hart of Colorado and, and William Cohen of Maine, uh, visited the embassy on several occasions, and they graciously agreed to brief our British allies on this new, improved American military. Our British allies, incidentally, were a little skeptical of that notion, uh, having just witnessed the difficulties we'd gone through uh, in Vietnam. Shortly thereafter, uh, I watched with, with fascination as a makeshift flotilla of British warships and about 30 jump jet Harrier aircraft successfully used innovation and agility to overcome the mass of Argentina's more traditional military in the Falklands War. I recall reporting back to Washington that the Brits clearly were applying some new thinking to traditional ways of fighting a war. Perhaps our military cultures, I, I remember thinking, which had seemed somewhat out of touch uh, during Vietnam, were capable of learning uh, and adapting. In any event, uh, after a couple marvelous years in London, 
I returned to Colorado in my teaching job at the Air Force Academy. Uh, it didn't last very long. Once again, I became restless. And in 1986, the Air Force allowed me to leave the Academy and return to operational intelligence if I would agree to serving a tour in Moscow. Well, my wife and I jumped at the chance. We spent a year at the Foreign Service Institute, uh, immersed in the Russian language and culture, and headed off to Embassy Moscow, where I was to serve as the defense attaché. There, at a very crucial period in Russian history, we watched an increasingly cumbersome economic and, and political system struggling to remain alive, to say nothing of remaining militarily competitive uh, with, with the West. But more important for our purposes here today, a perfect storm of technological advancement, sophisticated communications and political as well as economic turmoil throughout the communist world was setting the stage for a new, different kind of world. Now, the job of military attaches in places like Embassy Moscow, as I'm sure you are aware, is to keep Washington informed about developments in the Soviet Union, uh, which was, after all, at that time, our major opponent. Unfortunately, in a very real sense, we blew it. We sent lots of reports back to Washington about tanks, ships, planes, and other military instruments, but never once suggested that the Communist House of Cards was about to crumble. Stanley Hoffman, a graduate school professor of mine, used to assert that when new answers emerged for three questions, the result was a new international political system. As I recall, the questions were, one, who are the players? Two, what can they do to one another? And three, what do they wish to do uh, to one another? Now, as military attaches, we should have been thinking about these three questions rather than simply monitoring and documenting Soviet ships, planes, tanks, and missiles. Incidentally, despite some Monday morning quarterbacks uh, who now claim to the contrary, I don't recall anyone in the intelligence community anticipating during the late 80s that the Soviet Union and its ideology would simply collapse of its own weight. And so it is that I return to the central point of my remarks today. We were tardy in accepting the need to think differently. The traditional thought patterns that we used for the diplomatic, military, economic arenas during the Cold War were simply insufficient for comprehending the transition to this new world. Let me illustrate the point with a couple of examples, first from Vietnam and then from Moscow. In Vietnam, I was a photo interpreter. My job was to gather information and photography that our reconnaissance planes and somewhat later our reconnaissance satellites collected flying over our opponent's turf. This included a heavy steel bridge in Vietnam at a place called Tan Hoa. It, as was the case for all significant targets in Vietnam, Washington, usually the basement of the White House, uh, made the decision about whether to take down such targets, and we were given instructions to blow up that bridge. For several years, we tried to destroy it. Each morning, uh, we would inform Washington about whether the bridge was up or down. We lost eight or nine air crews in the process because the North Vietnamese knew we were after the bridge and circled it with surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft artillery. When, a, when a, an F-4 Phantom jet with one of our fledgling smart bombs finally did the trick, we celebrated in every military club throughout the Far East. I can assure you we really did know how to celebrate in those days uh, as well. Well, a couple of weeks later, aerial reconnaissance showed that the Viet Cong had constructed a very crude pontoon bridge a couple hundred yards up the river. It was adequate for their purposes because they didn't have uh, a lot of heavy equipment. They had to get back and forth across that river. When we were addressing the question, is the bridge up or down, 
we should also have been asking, why are we going after this bridge? The first question was easy to answer. The second question was far more complicated. And incidentally, it's not legitimate to say we went after that bridge because that's what we did in World War II, although that may have been the accurate answer to the question. Things hadn't changed that much when I served in Moscow. I'd spent lots of time, uh, I still spent lots of time fo focusing on what I call the easy questions. How many ships, planes, and tanks do the Soviets have, and are they any good? And the Soviets continued to accommodate this challenge with May Day parades of shiny new weapon systems, which my colleagues and I duly photographed and sent back to Washington. To be sure, there were occasions when I wondered whether things on the Soviet side were actually as impressive as they seemed. I remember, for example, my wife coming home day after day in, in late 1987 and 1988 uh, with slim pickings from the rather empty Moscow grocery stores. This Soviet bunch will never make it, she used to mumble in frustration. I can't believe I've been afraid of them all my life, I heard her blurt out one evening. In retrospect, I realized that she was articulating what we call a hunch in the intelligence game. She hadn't studied Soviet defense strategy and wasn't being paid to think about their military capabilities and intentions. But her instincts were at work, and I should have listened more closely to her. But once again, I was busy counting planes, tanks, and ships and getting those hard numbers back to Washington. I didn't notice, for example, that bread was fed to the farm animals because the disastrous pricing system in the Soviet Union made it cheaper than corn and grain. My intelligence reports were like the lesson plans I had written while teaching at the academy. They were logically tight usually limited to three substantive points. That was all either my students or Washington could handle in one sitting. Uh, and they connected the dots in a very linear fashion. In both Vietnam and Moscow, the questions about, what, uh, the questions about which we worked the hardest were the easy ones. Was the Tanwa Bridge up or down? What was the composition of the Soviet force structure in terms of plane ships, tanks, and missiles? These were linear problem sets. David Moore, a senior, a senior analyst at the National Security Agency, calls them tame problems. A RAND Corporation scholar and former CIA analyst, Greg Treverton, calls them puzzles. The questions that we also should have been asking, why are we going, why are we going after the Tanwa Bridge? And what does the future hold for the Soviet Union, not only in terms of its military capabilities, but also its political and economic stability, as well as its intentions in the security arena. Those are nonlinear and very hard to answer questions. They are what national security analyst David Moore and social researchers call these days wicked problem sets. Greg Treverton calls them mysteries. I like the word mess the best. These problems are complex and ill-defined. You can't get the answers by simply counting things or connecting the dots. When you get the answers, they are never totally right or wrong. Whether you end up in the military or in the private sector, this messy world is where most of the problem sets are that you millennials in this audience are going to have to deal with uh, today. And to make matters worse, these problem sets will require a sophisticated effort on your part to balance competing notions of pure reason and less rational approaches. You'll need to pay attention to your gut instincts, not only your own gut instincts, but those of your spouses and your professional colleagues. The challenge that C.P. Snow famously described during his Reed lecture I think it was in 1959 in London, about reconciling the two cultures of science and the arts remains alive and well, uh, not only in the academic world, 
but also in the practical worlds of the profession of arms and the private sector professions uh, as well. And in these professions, you will not have the option of choosing between science and the arts. You must be able to use them both. In short, today's wicked problem sets require an understanding of both the second law of thermodynamics and the thoughts of Aristotle. Well, if you buy the notion that we needed new ways of thinking to deal adequately with the Cold War, with Vietnam, with the demise of, and with the demise of communism and the Soviet Union, just think about the challenges we face today in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Professor Hoffman's three questions, who are the players, what are their capabilities, what do they wish to do to one another, all have new answers. And the result is a far more complex world of national security. We've, we've learned in Iraq, the hard way perhaps, that simply blowing things up, however brilliantly this traditional military approach may have been carried out, did not guarantee victory in any meaningful sense. The object of conflict on the global scale today turns out to have much to do with subjective factors like the attitudes of our opponent populaces, or for that matter of our friends in Paris, London, Bonn, or indeed our countrymen in Peoria, Boston, and St. Louis. As, as General Petraeus and, and his acolytes have pointed out, to be successful, we needed a new way of thinking in our national security enterprise. We needed a new strategy with additional instruments of conflict. He asked the hard questions, crafted a strategy of counterinsurgency, and helped bring about new instruments that included our narrative or story. Ultimate success or failure increasingly has come to rest on our national credibility and the skill we show in articulating this story. The C-17 transport aircraft flying relief supplies to Haiti or to Pakistan could have a greater impact on our security predicament by, because of the story it tells about who we are as Americans than does the F-16 fighter aircraft with its load of bombs. My son who spent 17 years driving that F-16 doesn't always agree when I make this assertion, but I think I'm right. It's a world where the players are best characterized as complex adaptive systems where very small changes in initial conditions can have dramatic effects downstream. It's a world where a handful of terrorists with box cutters and a commercial airliner can transform the structure and stability of our international system. Yes, the, the butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil or wherever it was uh, most certainly can produce a tornado in Texas. And incidentally, I would submit that a similar phenomenon pertains to virtually all the professions that you millennials are preparing to enter after your graduation. Such are the challenges that your generation faces in this nonlinear world. Well, what does this mean for those of us in this, in this room today, particularly uh, those headed for the profession of arms? As I was putting this presentation together, our then Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, was quoted in the press as asserting in his usual uh, colorful fashion, we don't know what the hell is going to happen. I first assumed he was referring to the complex world of international relations, and I agreed completely with this assessment. Then, however, I realized he was referring to the actions of our own Congress regarding how to deal with current domestic issues, specifically sequestration. Frankly, I think his blunt assessment was appropriate for this arena uh, as well. But more importantly, for our purposes th this afternoon, uh, is the fundamental reality that regardless of the fate of sequestration, economic constraints in the future of the defense establishment are real and likely to be enduring. And the security challenges that we face are not going to get easier. 
senior leaders from all the military services now seem resigned to the inevitability of our military becoming smaller in size. Indeed, it could well be that quantitative reductions in ships, planes, tanks, and fighting personnel may be very substantial. To be sure, the military has experienced the ebb and flow of resources for defense several times in recent decades. The so-called peace dividend following the end of the Cold War is, is most certainly an example. And each time there has been discussion about, quote, doing more with less, end quote. Each time we have tried to stretch the capabilities of those ships, planes, tanks that I talked about to cover a security challenge that was getting, that more often than not, was becoming larger. The traditional lens through which our military has viewed this challenge is the concept of combined arms warfare, an approach which has dominated strategic thinking for centuries and remains the prescribed doctrine that all military services tend to follow in maximizing power. In essence, it centers on the notion of finding efficiencies by developing strategies and force structures that allow our ships, planes, tanks, and missiles to operate together more coherently. This makes sense, of course. Uh, no one would argue that it's better for military capabilities to function incoherently. But will this approach continue to enable the military to, quote, do more with less, end quote, in sufficient measure to bridge the gap which is now emerging between decreasing capabilities on the one hand and increasing complex security requirements on the other? I think not. As, as my colleague and friend, Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, who recently retired from the Air Force as the Chief of Intelligence, likes to say, we can no longer blast or buy our way to success. We must think our way to victory. The challenge goes well beyond what we think, incidentally. It's also how we think about the wicked problem sets that I have asserted lie in the professional arenas to which all of you students are headed, particularly those in the ROTC detachment. It's time we look for a different way of thinking about how to protect our nation's security in an international system for which there are once again new answers to Professor Hoffman's three very important questions. We are involved in a battle of wits, and we must update the way we use them to match the increasingly complicated way in which we live. For starters, I would suggest that we move our traditional emphasis on the concept of combined arms warfare, with its focus on the more efficient use of planes, tanks, ships, and so forth, toward a more broadly based concept of combined effects. Simply stated, it means moving the fundamental question we ask from how uh, to structure and operate military equipment more coherently toward what it is we wish to accomplish. This combined effects lens allows us to focus on what Sun Tzu asserts is the essence of resolving conflict. That is, getting into the heads of our opponents. And, I should say, altering their perceptions to accord more closely with our own. It also opens the door to a broader spectrum of foreign policy tools, which include nonviolent as well as traditional destructive instruments of warfare. It bolsters our strength by adding, by adding uh, to our traditional military toolkit the full arsenal of diplomatic, informational, economic, and social instruments. The same challenge, incidentally, holds for our opponents. They also are struggling to understand the implications of Professor Hoffman's three questions. The result is a messy, interactive process during which we and our opponents view truly wicked problem sets 
through constantly changing concepts, models, frameworks, lenses, a whole variety of terms are used, which we humans are wired to use when issues are too complex for us to grasp in a holistic fashion. For Sun Tzu, of course, ultimate victory is when the perspectives of the opponents merge and when war is avoided. For others, such as, as the brilliant military strategist John Boyd, the opponent who can understand and adapt most quickly to these changing realities will be victorious, even when the opponent's perceptions continue to conflict. Whatever the case, it may well be that only a combination of diplomatic, informational, economic, and social instruments, as well as traditional military instruments, can achieve success in the complex society, security arena uh, we face today. And getting there, I would submit, once again, requires a new way of thinking on the part of the American defense establishment, as well as uh, leadership in the other professions. Incidentally, assuming that increased complexity affects all professions these days, the requirement for new thinking awaits virtually all of you millennials sitting in this room today. And you are going to find that it's not easy to change ways of thinking within institutional structures and processes that await you since too many of them were designed by my generation to deal with a much less complicated world. As I suggested at the beginning of my remarks, we have left you with something of a mess. Regarding this challenge, however, you millennials give cause for optimism. In various academic and operational assignments, I have observed millennials since you begin to appear on our college comp uh, campuses during the 90s. I actually spent 10 years uh, associated with a, uh, a very good liberal arts college on the East Coast uh, after leaving the Air Force uh, the first time. Uh, here are a handful of summary comments about my experience with your generation, you millennials. First, you are high maintenance. You're used to lots of feedback. You're not reluctant to communicate candidly with your uh, academic administrators or colleagues uh, and supervisors in your professional lives. I was a college president for nine years and, and I heard a lot about helicopter parents. Uh, they exist. Uh, and, and when you're a college president in a small institution, you don't have a lot of protection. And when, they're, when the television doesn't work in, in a student's room, you hear directly uh, from the students' major allies. You millennials' major allies, incidentally, are your parents. You, ma you maintain a very close relationship with your parents. I had to change my whole recruiting strategy uh, as a college president uh, when I realized that the previous generations where parents would say, well, John and Mary will decide where they're going to college, uh, that has changed. In the, among the millennials, those parents are active participants in the process of making such decisions. Secondly, uh, you are serious about educational experiences relevant to your future. Earlier generations of students uh, often looked at their college life as an escalator experience. Give us our diplomas at the end of the ride, but don't mess with us on the way up, they would say. Millennials are different. Your line is quite different. You expect a quality experience on the escalator uh, as well. Challenge us with quality programs and we'll put out, give us crap courses and we'll blow you off, is the bottom line for your generation. In sum, the millennial generation is a natural partner for entities that embrace excellence as a core value. I think that's really neat. Simply stated, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, let me offer one concluding comment uh, about intellectual courage. Simply stating, stated, I'm referring to the courage required for members of all professions to ask the very profound question, is there a better way when you encounter organizational structures and processes that seem out of sync 
with the age in which you live. I'm making a call, if you will, for sophisticated audacity. And I'm addressing you millennials, regardless of which prof profession you choose. The challenges go well beyond what to think. It's also how you think about nonlinear problem sets in particular that rest on new realities, on new principles, and that render traditional linear approaches of my generation insufficient, uh, if not irrelevant. To be successful, you will need to bring to the fight both scientific, rational tools, as well as the intuitive, more creative dimensions of the human character. Yes, you will need to know, you will need to understand both the second law of thermodynamics and the thinking of Aristotle. More importantly, you will need to appreciate that only the human mind, not modern technology, can reconcile the two worlds the worlds of science and the worlds of the arts, uh, particularly if moral and ethical dimensions are to be included in your calculation. Needless to say, uh, your preparation for this cannot await on-the-job training. Good thinking is an acquired aspect of character, and it has to be, it must be developed over time. It must start at the academic institutions where you find yourselves at the moment and continue throughout the lifetime of your professional careers. You must be, in effect, courageous, intellectual warriors. We need you in all professions. Thank you. I hope I've stimulated some conversation questions. Fire away. So we have yep. some questions. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm uneasy because you said about the change in perspective. I look at our military with the old bias of conflict and interest. The more we use arms and war, the more we are important as the military. And that has a lot to do with this old way of thinking. If you have a gun, let's use it. And I, I think we've gotten into wars and conflicts just because the military wanted to keep its prestige and importance. I'm not sure I'd phrase it that way, but quite frankly, the point you've made is, is a point I was trying to make in my comments. Um, when I talk about Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu who says the object of the game is to get in the head of your opponent. It's a, it's a lot more difficult to get in the head of your opponent than it is to blow that head off. And the easy way sometimes particularly if you're focusing on the military instrument alone. Uh, everything looks like a nail out there when the only hammer you have uh, is the military. What I'm arguing for is a, a fundamental change in how we address the issue. I'm saying let's not ask how we can, let's not ask as the first question how we can make our military more effective. As the first question, let's ask what it is we're trying to achieve. And when you ask that question, you open the field to a much broader, uh, a much broader uh, assortment of tools. Uh, and you know, I mentioned General Petraeus, and I'm aware that we have lots of Army folks here. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm one of those who thinks Petraeus, th the quality of Petraeus' thinking was spectacular, and he got this. He got this notion. Uh, and not only did he understand it personally, but he was effective in introducing it in the Army dialogue. Uh, so I think you and I are, are in violent agreement here. It's just maybe I wasn't sufficiently articulate well, how you. I expressed my, my point. Yes, sir. Uh, it, you speak of the transition from the older to the newer. How would you assess the military's ability to adapt to the new challenges of asymmetric warfare? Uh, well, the military is no different from any other uh, traditional uh, institution. Uh, we are we were reluctant to change. Uh, we don't like the question, is there a better way? My generation in particular doesn't like the question, is there a better way? Because the answer is virtually yes in every case when you focus on what my generation left. For the, for the millennials 
uh, to deal with. The, the structures that we put together are, are designed primarily for linear issues. They're designed for the easy questions. Uh, I, I understand you're going to be having a presentation on predators uh, coming up. If you look closely at the program we have for those predators, we put a lot of resources into what I call the shiny fast things, the predators themselves. But the real effect you're, you want to accomplish with those predators has something to do with creating knowledge. And if you look at the amount of effort we put into the analytic capability to support those predators, what you find is that we are lacking. Uh, and that's a classic, uh, that's a, a traditional way. We, we, like, we like the fast, shiny predators because they look a lot like, in our Air Force, the herit our heritage of, of flight. We haven't addressed, I would argue, adequately the capability to take the facts and data that they produce, which incidentally is only the first step in that march toward knowledge. We haven't come to grips with the challenge of transforming those facts and data into the kind of knowledge that will enable us to create the effect that, uh, that we're after. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to wait for us old duffers to die, but I'm saying it might help. <laughs> <laughs> solve the problem that you've asked about. Yes, ma'am. I'm concerned in how do you get into the head of North Korea and Iran? Very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, but, but unless you get into the head of North Korea and Iran, you're not going to achieve a lasting victory. Uh, I, I just read a fascinating article uh, by, a, by a Brit in a journal called, I think, Innovation something or other. It's a, it's a, new, it's a new journal. But he made the point in a, in a way that I'd never thought about before. He said, you know, World War II did not end with the destruction of the German military infrastructure. He argues that World War II didn't end until the Germans realized that they were being offered a better economic system, a better future, than they had before the war started. At that point, World War, that's the Marshall Plan in essence, that was when he would argue uh, World War II uh, finished. And if you think back to the experience at the end of World War I, when our solution was Versailles, and, and when we really put the screws on the Germans, what we did, we didn't end that war, we created World War II. Created World war II. Uh, so, I believe that's an example of Sun Tzu's notion that victory comes only with getting into the head of heads of, of, of uh, your opponents. Now, Clausewitz adds that to that notion, his early notions about uh, complexity, which I think are also uh, spot on. Getting into the heads of an opponent is not a linear process. It's a really hard thing to do, uh, and, and uh, certainly Iran and North Korea uh, are examples of that. But if you go back and, you know, maybe we, for historic, are there any historians, how many historians are here? There must be some. Okay, well, uh, if you go back and, and look objectively at the tools we have used with regard to, to North Korea, it seems to me it would be legitimate to say, did we use that full spectrum of tools, or did we focus on the military? Is that the only tool we used? Well, they uh, focus on sanctions. Pardon? It, well, sanctions are, you know, they're also uh, uh, just a, a, less, a lesser version of, of military right. force. Uh, I hope that answers your, your question. You, you know, you've asked a tough one. It's, it's, it, is, it is hard to get in the heads of opponents. But ultimately, uh, it seems to me, unless we're successful in doing that, we cannot be victorious in any meaningful sense. Everything is temporary. The, the article to which I referred, he essentially argues that if you're focused only on linear thinking, if that's the only attack you take, and on combined arms, warfare, 
you don't know when the war starts, and you don't know when it ends. It doesn't start when the gun goes off. It starts, perhaps, when the kid stands in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square with a tulip or whatever. I mean, that at the molecular level is the beginning of what in the, in the age of social media can become an enormous power. And quite frankly, we haven't thought about that. Yes, sir. How do you think the uh, military can encourage critical thinking, like new thought, when it sort of promotes such a, uh, so, a solidified like, version of thought, like this unit-based unit thought? Well, uh, I'm not sure I'm willing to accept lock, stock, and barrel the premise of, uh, of your question. I certainly appreciate that we have, we have tendencies in that direction. But I've been quite frankly impressed with the dialogue that I see, particularly in the United States Army. If you read the professional journals uh, that the Army puts out these days, you have you know, a flock of lieutenant colonels really poking hard at senior leadership in a way that I think traditionally we would not associate with military dialogue. Uh, so uh, I'm not ready to write off uh, the military as a hopeless cause. Uh, I think, I think uh, there is some good thinking uh, that, that is taking place out there, some interesting, uh, some interesting dialogue. Uh, my, my own chief, the new chief of staff of the United States Air Force, said in one of his first speeches, we need to ask ourselves what we're going to be when we grow up. Now that is an explosive question. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's an important question. And an Air Force that's willing has the guts to ask that question and follow through is an Air Force that has hope. Uh, so I, I, I take the, the gist of your, I understand your question, uh, and it's something we, we have to watch very closely, but, but I, I'm not willing to surrender, I'm not willing to throw the white flag up uh, on, the, on the challenge that you put your finger on, which is clearly an important challenge. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I put my glasses on. You said the other time that the challenges are going to get easier. Say again? You said the other time that the challenges are going to get easier. And I want to start by quoting the fact that you said every generation has a relative of safety in the family mission. And you said that you will feel or to pray. And I believe we are here today. I'm not sure I'm getting the gist of your question. I think what you're saying is, what about Syria? No, yeah, I'm talking about Syria now. In Syria, which is Assad regime right now, which is a secular regime. I don't understand why you know, they are saying uh, Assad should go, which is a secular regime, and to be replaced by another Islamic extremist regime. Because you talk about in, right now, North Korea is a threat, and Iran, and I will not say we want to add another Islamic regime which should also be a threat to the United States and the global peace. Can you, can you help me with I, yeah, I, I think that I don't I don't hear very well. I, I, I think his question is basically uh, with regard to uh, Syria. What, yeah. what do you see the issues there and uh, some for someone who is not from the United States trying to understand what's all this about? Well, the first thing I would say is, if you recall, I talked about messy problems. Syria, I think, represents the ultimate in messiness. Uh, but it's typical, although more serious, than the messiness that we have with regard to North Korea, the messiness that we have with regard to Iran, uh, and so on. Uh, I don't have I don't have a silver bullet. 
Uh, and, and quite frankly, it's such a complicated issue that I, I would not poke at what the current administration has done, and I'll be very leery about poking at what they, you know, what they, they ultimately do. It's obvious that there are different attitudes among our leadership at this time concerning how, how best to deal with, with, with the Syrian situation. Uh, but, I, but I would argue that the, our only hope for dealing with a messy problem like Syria is to develop that, is to use that new way of thinking I was describing, where we don't ask as a first question, how do we prepare to go blow something up? But rather ask as the first question, what is it we're attempting to achieve? What's the, what's the bottom line effect? And then look at the spectrum of tools that are available to get at it and make sure that the military tool is the last in line. Uh, not use it until we, until we get there. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, uh, again, I'm going to poke a little bit at your premise <laughs> and, and recommend you, you take a look at, at some of the professional journals that are, that are emerging from our military and what you find. I mean, the most interesting information in an organizational structure is always the information that comes from the bottom up. It's worth more in spades than what you get from the top down. We didn't realize that in Vietnam, incidentally, and among other reasons for, for uh, failure there uh, that, that exists. Uh, what, I would, what, I would re what I would argue in response to your question is that, that the notion that you must pay attention to where, where knowledge takes place, where, where, where thought, relevant thought uh, takes place, is closer to the bottom of the organizational structure than it is the top. Good leaders recognize that. And, and there are some examples out there of good leadership. I mean, I mentioned one, uh, General Petraeus. Uh, if you look, look at the staffs that General Petraeus put together for the various challenges he faced, they weren't all four-star generals by any stretch. I mean, he, he had this in fact, if you looked at the PhD uh, rate of the staffs he has put together on frequent occasion, they look better than the PhD levels of colleges and universities. And there are times when his whole staff came from very elegant uh, academic, uh, academic backgrounds. That, I would argue, is, is recognition of the point you're trying to make. You, the role of, I would argue, the role of senior leadership in, in working through this new way of thinking is to provide top cover for the folks in the organizational structure who perhaps have chalk on their shoes from stepping on the line uh, in an intellectual way as they address the question, is there, uh, is there a better way? Uh, I've, I've read some of the literature, although it's not my primary field, uh, about the private sector and how they're dealing with this. And it turns out that, that like uh, your description of the military, when they really want to see, have innovation take place, more often than not, they will buy an innovative little company that, that's, that's working very well in that regard and bring it on board and suck it for all it's worth. Uh, and create their innovative uh, impetus, if you will, with that kind of a start. Because, it, because of the extreme difficulty in, <laughs> in rejiggering how the traditional institutional uh, hierarchy looks at that question, is there, is there a better way?